Welcome to another of our LD EduChat uh, webinars. This is our second series, our summer 2021 series. And today we are joined by Tamina Begum, who some of you may have tuned in to see earlier on in the year when we looked at outstanding remote learning. And one of the things that we sort of came back from that was how much more people wanted to hear from her. And I think it's really important, obviously, that she, we thank her, obviously, for her time today, because we're very aware that as a head teacher, as a school leader at this time, it is incredibly sort of uh, precious to try and find some time to spend with ourselves to go through some of the ideas that she's putting in place at Forest Gate Community School. So, we, you know, it's, it's firstly, massive, massive thank you. And secondly, thank you, obviously, to the audience as well, who obviously put such desire on sort of spending more time with her. So I think one of the things that's worth acknowledging is that she is a senior leader who's doing fantastic things at a school that's faced challenges. Um, and there's a lot that she's done within the time that she's been there having since been appointed as one of the youngest head teachers in the country. And I don't want to steal her thunder and sort of give away any of the sort of the bits and pieces that she's gone through. So I'll leave that for her to go through. So um, as with all of our sessions, though, a little bit of housekeeping just before we jump in. These sessions are all being recorded, will be uploaded to our YouTube page. We will be sharing that with the, all of the people that have registered for the webinar and that form part of our mailing list as well. And it'll be up on our YouTube page very, very shortly. Throughout the course of the session this evening, you'll find at the bottom of the screen about here, there's a QA and a tab. There's also um, a chat function as well. So obviously, if you want to pose any questions um, to Tamina, by all means, feel free to type them there and we'll pose those to her later on after she's presented. Uh, Tamina, are you there? Hi, everyone. Hello. Hi, Tamina. I don't want to hold up much more. So I'm going to firstly, again, thank you obviously for being here and I'll pass straight over to you jump straight into some of uh, sharing some of the ideas and the work that we're doing. Brilliant. I'm going to um, just share my screen in the most smooth way possible. Can you see my screen? Yeah, it's all, all working. Okay, brilliant. Um, hi, everyone. Um, as, uh, my name is Tamina Begum. I'm the head teacher at Forest Gate Community School. I just want to firstly say um, Thank you to the Chiltern Learning Trust for giving me the opportunity to present today. Um, I have named the presentation Get Better Faster based on the book Get Better Faster by uh, Paul Bambrick and Toyo, because I feel like it captures the spirit behind uh, our approach as a school um, towards kind of our professional development and us um, improving. OK, so just a quick background, I guess, um, of Forest Gate Community School. Just gonna um, make my screen a little bit bigger. Um, so a little bit of uh, context, the Forest Gate Community School is a um, school-based, secondary community school based in Newham, London Borough of Newham. So it serves quite a diverse uh, community. Many of our students come from quite challenging backgrounds, but uh, despite that, the school is very high performing. It's come top 50 um, for progress nationally. Um, it was Ofsted, uh, 2013 RI and it moved to outstanding in 2016 and then outstanding again in 2020 under the new framework. So I took on the headship at uh, uh, two years ago now, but I have been at Forest Gate since 2013 in various roles, including, um, you know, being in charge of uh, the brilliant team English here. Uh, I've had kind of responsibilities over things like staff training, uh, professional development and all things teaching and learning and that's what this session will largely be about okay and as a school our challenge currently is really to maintain uh, the excellent outcomes and all the really good practices uh, that we uh, enjoy and benefit from and I'm going to be talking a little bit about how we do that today. So we talk a lot about kind of habits as a school um, and, and as pr practitioners uh, you know habits being hard to lose once formed in there's lots of literature and research behind um, our professional development and when we first start off in teaching uh, you know we we kind of accelerate in our practice a little bit like this and then we plateau after the first few years and there's lots of reasons behind this um, and what we've kind of talked about was if we can identify the behaviors particular behaviours that we can become conscious of that lead to really good practice. Um, and if we apply a bit of effort, okay, once we've identified those, and we do it over and over and over and over again, whenever it is, um, we, we see, see fit to do it, we will develop really good habits. Um, and vice versa, if we can disrupt bad habits, 
by being conscious of the behaviors that lead to those, uh, we can develop really good habits. So those, those are the kind of things we, we've spoken about as a staff and that has informed our um, uh, professional development and our ongoing training as a school. So EDI then, we explicit direct instruction. I've put the definition there and essentially uh, for those who aren't familiar, it's basically a collection of research-based instructional practices um, from the likes of people like Hattie, Rosenshine, etc. And when you combine all of those, you get EDI and all it is, is the most effective teachers use these techniques. We've used this to base or create a lesson framework that we use as a school and essentially it's a it's a blueprint of excellence you know in the classroom and we use it uh, to discuss our classroom practice we use it as a base from which we construct our CPD for all teachers and when kind of our new teachers see it, it's really helpful for them uh, it's it's you know to see something that they know, okay, this is what's expected of me. This is where I need to aim to be uh, in terms of my practice. So it's really, really development, um, developmental. And for our kind of more experienced teachers or our really good teachers who've been doing it for ages, they look at it and they think, oh, actually, yeah, this makes sense. I recognize a lot of this practice in my own practice. Um, and I didn't say our best teachers, um, and, I, and I, we don't use that term because, um, you know, we use the quote from Dylan William, I know lots of schools do, it's a really good quote, the idea that teachers can uh, always improve, not because we're not good enough, but because we can be even better. And so what we do is we use this, uh, uh, using this we want to define what uh, Bambrick Santoyo refers to in his book, Get Better Faster, as action steps. Um, what are the behaviours, you know, required to perfect clarity and instruction? What are the behaviours required to uh, grab the attention of your class really quickly so you're not wasting any seconds, etc. If we identify those behaviours, we consciously practice them over and over again. We will form really good habits. Okay. Um, so, currently, these are the things that we are working on as a school for the, for the last two years, despite the distractions via the pandemics. We want no wasted seconds in learning, okay? We want confident and articulate speakers. So we do lots of work around uh, oracy, being confident in the way that we speak. Um, and finally, this is what our session is about today, we want to get better faster, okay? Or we will get better faster. Now, before I go into that last one, what I really wanna do is allow you to see the conditions that are already in place as a school to facilitate and allow us to be able to work on this last priority. And I think it's important because often school leaders um, might, or, or any of us might go away on a CPD and see something that we think is a really great idea and we want to come back and lift and drop it into our own context. But actually, um, it's very important, I think, to um, really appreciate the conditions that have been set up to facilitate certain things. And in this case, it's our approach to getting better faster. So a whistle stop tour then uh, of these six or so years between 2013 and 2019. The reason I started 2013, obviously Forest Gate's been around longer than that, but it's when I started, but also when we got that dreaded RI from Ofsted soon after I actually arrived, not that I got them with me. Um, but the very first thing uh, that we did was, or one of the things that we did, this is in no particular order actually, we replaced formal lesson observations with learning, ongoing learning walks. Now, I know lots of schools do this and I think it's the way to go if you haven't done it. You know, we all know formal lesson observations are one-offs. They're not a reflection of the quality of teaching across the school. It's highly stressful and it doesn't give you the information that you need. Whereas learning walks, we use Google Forms. So it allows us to receive real-time feedback on the quality of teaching and learning across the school over time. Uh, retrospective bookmarking was replaced, your old school kind of taking the books away, marking the work that has been done, giving it back after you've finished, whenever that is, um, to the students. We replaced that with live marking. So we used um, EF um, definition of good feedback, timely and specific. And we think this live marking approach really meets that definition of effective feedback. So we make sure that every lesson has a good amount of time where students are able to apply what they've learned in their lesson. 
uh, and that could look like answering a, um, an extended writing question or equivalent in a practical. And during that time, where students have that time to apply their learning, you know, most good lessons have the success criteria that they've got to fulfill to do that task really well. And that success criteria is usually bullet pointed, okay, on the board. We've just replaced the bullet points with coded targets, so T1, T2, T3, whatever it may be. And the teacher will actively monitor, go around and um, look for what is missing from the criteria. So it might be T2, they've forgotten to do this in their piece of writing. They would write T2 and they, the teacher will walk away and the student will look at T2, see what it stands for and then respond to it straight away. And that has been transformational on a number of levels. So number one, it has um, completely impacted in a positive way the teacher workload and well-being as a result of that. We're no longer taking reams of books home just before a book look, um, who are you doing it for? Uh, students aren't receiving feedback that is no longer timely, you know, two weeks later when we've had a chance to get through it all. Um, and students really love that instant gratification, that, that um, recognition they get from their teachers. So they're really motivated by it. Number three, then we've continued our collective work on our curriculum. That's that's ongoing, it still happens now, and it we can we intend to continue that. And that's been really important in being happy with what we are delivering in the classroom, you know, the practical implementation of our design here. One of the things we use that has been integral to this approach is an online web-based um, program called DPR or Dynamic Progress Reporting System. And it essentially it holds our curriculum that our subject leads have designed and it facilitates real-time tracking of our students learning over time. So teachers can basically update judgments of key learning objectives that we've defined based on that particular student over time. Students have access to it, parents have access to it, teachers have access to it and they can do it whenever they want to see evidence for it and that has really supported um, students' attitude towards learning, but also teachers' understanding of what quality learning is meant to be happening um, and their progress as a result. Number four then, so one of the things that I um, kind of struck me when I first arrived was this idea of talent spotting early. I didn't recognise it as that in the beginning, but what I did recognise was, um, you know, me and others like me who were quite early in their career, relatively speaking, or new to the school, we were recognised really quickly when we did something good. And it's a, it's a school and now a trust approach to developing our staff members and, and upskilling them and nurturing um, really good practice. And this is done in a really deliberate way as a school and as a trust. And, and it's an ongoing, essentially a coaching slash mentoring program. I need to mention Team English because um, I'm biased and Team English is the best in the school. Um, although there are brilliant departments who actually are on par now with Team English, but they are uh, one of the, among many things that has uh, meant Team English was best in the country for progress in 2017 has churned out brilliant outcomes for our students was the high quality mentoring and training okay they are you know invested deliberately in identifying and closely supporting anyone who joined team english whether they were new to the profession or not and on a kind of large and we've used these strategies across our departments and it's really transformed the way that people have joined the school really adapted to our practices and their, the impact that they've had on the students. Generally then, you know, we recognise that the school, the school is high performing and with that comes pressure points throughout the school and, and you can't hide from that. Um, and so we do have high expectations, but with that we've got very high support and that has uh, been set up via our systems, okay? And it allows us to communicate expectations and support very clearly, um, ongoing monitoring, allows people to feel that safety and that clarity and follow through has been established and deliberately worked on as well. So nothing is kind of left by the wayside. We act quickly, we celebrate quickly and loudly, we support quickly and quietly. Um, and hopefully what you will have noticed is the bits that I've highlighted, there's a, there's a trend or a theme there and it's all about uh, time and being quick, which brings me then back to the priorities. And number three there, we will get better faster. So my unique challenge when I took on this uh, headship role was 
you know, what can I do to an already outstanding, uh, brilliant school where I'm surrounded by excellent teachers and staff? Well, um, I read this book, Get Better Faster, and I came across live coaching, okay? When I first read this book, uh, I had two thoughts. Number one, why did nobody give me this book when I was earlier on in my career? I could have been a much better teacher, faster, and I would have been a much better mentor, and I felt sorry for the mentees that I had earlier on. Um, and the second thought was, well, why can't we do this at Forest Gate School? We've got the conditions set up to facilitate the next thing, okay? And this is what I'm going to talk about today. The first, um, the way that I always first explain it is I use the analogy of spotting the spinach. Um, so like this lady here, she's got spinach in her teeth. So imagine, okay, I was talking to you in person, um, as I am now, and, and you noticed I had spinach in my teeth, right? And you can tell that I'm completely ob oblivious to it, you know, I have no idea. Um, and I would really hope you didn't tell me about that spinach in my teeth tomorrow, okay? By the way, Tamina, you know, yesterday you were talking about live coaching. You had a great big hunk of spinach in your teeth, just thought you should know. That is not helpful to me, okay? And it's not kind. Um, in the same way, we're applying it to our practice and what is what could be uh, better practice. If you notice, if we notice what could be better practice, with a little tweak, our highest leverage, we step in, in the moment. Who explains it better is Paul Bambrick Santoyo. So, and he, what he says is um, he uses real-time feedback with in hospital residency. So hospital residents performing their first surgeries. Okay, and they base it on two premises. Premise number one, a patient's life is of the utmost importance in medical care, okay? So a teaching doctor can keep that sacred whilst also training residents by simply stepping in when needed. And premise number two, accelerated development. So by stepping in and coaching in the moment, the experienced doctors deliver more feedback to residents and the residents get better faster okay they fix their mistakes they, they become experts quickly and it's not a luxury it's a necessity so the question becomes what would happen if in teaching we had to honor the same two premises of residency well it would look something like this okay premise number one a student's learning is of the utmost importance a leader can keep that sacred whilst also training teachers by simply stepping in when needed and premise number two, accelerated development. So by stepping in and coaching in the moment, they can deliver more feedback to the teachers and the teachers get better faster. They can fix their mistakes, become experts quickly. And in, when it comes to learning, it's not a luxury, but a necessity. Now, um, if we applied this then to the classroom, so I'll, I'll, I think I wrote about this, but I'll I'll kind of contextualize it to the classroom. So imagine, right, you've popped into my lesson, period one, Monday, and uh, Monday morning, and you notice that I have called for the class's attention, but I'm kind of hastily putting up my PowerPoint at the computer. So I'm half looking at my computer, half looking at the class, and you notice that um, the class hasn't really paid attention, half of them kind of have, and it's taken a good few minutes to get them all to pay attention. Do you notice, just a few tweaks in my delivery could have made that a lot better and then pay attention much faster. In other words, you spot the spinach in my delivery, okay? At this point, you could do one of two things. Option one, you could jot it down, okay, and make a mental note to let me know later on in the day. This would be when you're free, when I'm free, you've got a few meetings and lessons as well. Uh, by the time um, that you see me, it could be at the end of the day or the next day, okay? I will carry on calling my class like that, half at the computer, half looking at them distracted, in this way, in beginning of period two, beginning of period three, and so on, all the way to the end of the day. And by the end of that day, I've become quite practiced at calling my class for attention in that manner. Um, and it's almost become a habit for me, okay? And quite a bad one. Um, and when you finally get to me, might be at the end of the day or the next day, you, you give me that feedback and you tell me this is what you could have done to make it better. And I think, yeah, actually that makes sense. I'll try it. But in my mind, I'm thinking, can't quite remember when that happened. There were probably worse lessons after that. But yes, I might agree and try out the strategies that you suggest if I remember, okay? Or option number two, you step in live 
and you coach me to do it better. And you say to me, uh, there's lots of different ways to do it. I'll show you uh, a couple in a second, but, uh, and it goes, through the, it goes through these strategies in the book. Um, but you might say to me in this scenario, when you notice that the class hasn't paid attention, you might discreetly tell me, right, why don't you go and stand in the center front of the class, okay, away from the computer, use a strong voice and crane your neck as you call for attention of the class. Three simple concrete steps for me. I will listen to that and I will do it in the moment. And as soon as I try those three things, the, imagine the class pays attention straight away because those three things has worked straight away. I will feel that success. I'll be able to pinpoint exactly what went wrong in my first attempt and what's gone right in my second attempt. And because of that, I'll be now consciously aware of that tweak and I will do those three steps in the beginning of period two, period three, period four and so on, until by the end of the day, I become quite practiced at calling my class in this way, okay? It will almost become a habit by the end of the day, a good one. Um, and so the point here is this, there, there is common initial reluctance, and there has been in, when we rolled it out in, in, at Forest Gate, of doing life coaching. There's fears in the same way as there are fears about letting someone know that they've got spinach in their teeth in the moment. It's a little bit embarrassing, a little bit awkward. There's fears of under, not wanting to undermine and so on. Um, and I recognise these. That schools who aren't familiar or used to doing learning walks, for example, similar thing. Okay, But culture here is key. And for us, we, we've started off our training, which has been ongoing and revisited for um, throughout the last couple of years. We've applied these two premises of hospital residency, okay? Um, a student's learning is of the utmost importance and accelerated development. We want to get better faster. Um, so a culture that's build, built upon these two premises and one that makes life coaching a norm will make these initial re reservations redundant over time. Okay. And spotting the spinach and stepping in um, needs to be regarded nothing more than ordinary team teaching from a student's point of view and a move to get better faster from a teacher's point of view. Whatever our teaching experience, whoever we are. And when we do it, we do it because we're invested in the students' learning and each other's learning. Not because we're not good enough, but because we can be even better. And because it's live and in the moment, we know we can be even better faster. So... Um, these are four ways that I'll quickly whiz through because I can see that I'm uh, 29 minutes in. One way that you could do it, and this is part of the ongoing kind of training on how to do it that we've, um, we've delivered to staff throughout the year. You could ask the teacher, so put, your position, put yourself in the position of the student, ask the teacher, raise your hand and ask to jump in. Uh, say something like, you know, oh, you're making a really key point here, miss. Do you mind if I add to it? And this could be if you notice a high leverage point where you see that the teacher in their instruction might have missed a key point. That would tackle that, you'd, mod, you'd be coaching that. Um, and it, another way uh, you could ask the class a question. So what three things does sir want you to include? Again, if you missed, if you noticed um, clarity or lack of clarity in instruction, you could feign emotions. So that's my particular personal favorite. Um, the example here, you might gasp and say, oh, what a great response there. Can you make that 10% louder so we can all hear it? Because we're deliberately working on making our students speak with confidence in lesson. And the last one here I put down, model the skill, obviously. So the example that I gave about myself, um, you know, position yourself in the front of the room uh, to let the teacher see you, use a strong voice, call for silence, be seen looking. Four examples there, there are other ways um, that the book goes through as well. So Bambrick and Toyo talks about uh, the, uh, the fact that we've just got to do it. You know, you can talk about it with a teacher, uh, you can mentally prepare for it with a teacher, but if the teacher doesn't do it, that practice, uh, the adaptive practice, they won't learn what they need to learn from that experience, okay? They won't build that memory, uh, muscle memory required for the perfect practice, and they won't experience what it feels like to implement it successfully. And he says, we need to cut off imperfect practice, okay? The instant a teacher's practice is slightly off, the leader should step in, okay? This means that the teacher never has the chance to internalize any habits that would impede the success of that practice. And the practicing was dedicated to coaching the teacher on performing the skill correctly, not incorrectly. 
it has to be highest leverage. It has to be concrete um, and bite-sized enough for them to be able to achieve by themselves were you to go away and they to carry on thereafter. Um, and it has to be observable and practicable. Those are the three effective, uh, three criteria for effective action steps that he talks about. Now, um, how do, so when, when we first did it, or when I first introduced it, and we had a few training sessions, we did it with whole school, different uh, levels in the school, etc. cetera. Um, we, uh, you know, initially it was still, you know, a little bit, we didn't want to do it. People shied away from it. It was, you had to kind of get into it. So one of the strategies that we deployed, um, and by the way, what I must impress is our leadership really had to model this, um, you know, lead by example. And I believe not only is, you know, it, it's all about teacher development and getting better faster, but it's also, and I speak from a point of a school within a growing trust, okay? We've got a capacity build. We, we're upskilling each other very, very quickly. So not only from the coachee's point of view, but from the coach's point of view as well. Um, it is so important to be able to deliver effective feedback. And it all comes about back to uh, quality or high quality coaching and mentoring. And I think this really lends itself to that. So one way that we've kind of done it is I've made it the first agenda item in every line management meeting. So it means, um, you know, I'll meet the person I line manage. The first item, we'll spend 10 minutes, we'll leave my office and we'll go and do a quick learning walk. OK, 10 minutes, that's it. Um, and what it means is the person who I'm line managing, it could be my mentee, by the way, just mentor and mentee. We go together. I'm ensuring that that kind of feedback is moderated. We're ensuring a level of quality there. And every level this happens with. So mentors and mentees do it together. OK, so it's kind of um, less daunting initially when you're doing it with someone else. Hods and their teams. So HODs with their, um, you know, two ICs or their teachers, they invite them to go along with them. Our line managers with their teams, our teaching and learning teams with their teams, heads of years and their teams, they do it all together. It's moderated, it's quality assured, and it's normalized. So imagine our students seeing this in all of their lessons throughout the day. Okay, it's, it's normal to them. To them, it looks like team teaching. To our teachers who are receiving it, they're receiving it all the time and it's not a big deal. And that's important. The more you do it, the more you normalize it. And also uh, you're getting better at giving feedback as well. How do I quality assure that we're doing it properly then or that it's actually being done? Well, there's regular quality assurance of minutes. We do like our systems here, but it's very transparent. It's very open um, and it's very developmental. Uh, so people look at minutes and we see, you know, oh, that was a really good action step. That was a really good example of the way to step in that is uh, both inviting and supportive. So we, we quality assure minutes. We look at learning visits in our Google form and uh, take good elements of good practice and share this. Um, and we are providing very regular coaching training across the school. And it's not reserved just for leaders in the school. It's very much open to everyone. And what, what do we do with this data then? Well, we have weekly shares and celebrations of really good practice, examples that we're seeing all the time. And there are weekly uh, CPD sessions that we use the data to inform uh, those sessions. Okay, um, I'm nearly to the end now. I think I'm doing all right with time. I'm super conscious of it because I failed miserably the last time I did it for Children Learning Trust. So keeping the main thing about the main thing then, what am I talking about here? It's about teacher development and its impact on our students. So on the left-hand side, you've got all the different ways that we, or forums that we use to keep the main thing about the main thing, what we want to achieve, get better faster, okay? I won't go through all of them, but they're all our different forums. What I would mention here is that you know, they're both, they're divided into your formal and your informal methods, if you like. But our informal has proven to be really, really popular. And it's an indication for me uh, to know that our approach to this and the regard that teachers have towards their professional development um, is really, really positive. And it, it's an exciting thing. One thing that makes it really exciting and it keeps it really exciting is the fact that it's not just me, it's my teaching and learning team, 
okay? And um, there's one person missing, Rob Price. I'm really sorry, I couldn't find your, your picture on the on Sims, but Rob Price is also here. Um, and what these guys do, and I always, I apologize, but I'm gonna reveal my East London ruse. I um, liken them to hype men. Okay, I've got a gif here. This is a hype, these are hype men or examples of hype men. In the Urban Dictionary, I'm gonna give you the definition of hype men. Traditionally, the job of the hype man is to get the audience hype before a headlining performance comes on the stage. And their job is to keep the momentum going during the show, especially during down times, like wardrobe changes, set changes, or in the education context, national pandemics, um, pressure points in the year due to assessment deadlines, mock exams, things like that. There will be low points, but our exciting teaching and learning team, our early adopters, our cheerleaders, uh, will go out into their uh, subjects and in their areas and hype the main thing, which is our regard for getting better faster and doing what we love, which is teaching. What they do is they collate amazing examples of really good practice and they cheer it, they celebrate it. I wanted to share you one quick example here. So we've got a whole uh, series of I Love Hows and I took it as an idea from Doug Lemos Teach Like a Champion website, video with a narrative of what's really good about it. But it's a simpler version if you like. So we worked on in one of our kind of training sessions, brightening lines from Teach Like a Champion and um, we ca so one of our teaching learning team, we captured this video and let me see if it works. I hope it does. Okay, so one example of many of celebratory shares that not only share really good practice people copy and try to emulate but also recognizes the efforts that staff are going through to be better practitioners i am going to zoom through this uh, because um i'm nearly to the end now but one of the things that has informed our planning and our ongoing discussions as a staff is um the work by peps mccray in motivated teaching and the science behind motivation. So I can't remember where I saw this, somewhere on Twitter, I'm re I apologize that I can't credit you, but I'm gonna sum up the five levers that uh, he talks about in his book that affects and improves student motivation. And what we've done, and this again has informed, uh, I've shared this in training, is I've contextualized it to our particular strategies as a school to enable these levers okay so he talks about securing success give opportunities uh, for success in the subject early and often how do we do that well we do that um, via our edi approach you know through our questioning through our pitching modeling etc he also talks about like routines build routines around the how of learning so that our students are um, investing all their cognitive effort into the what of learning okay so make these uh, a habit and automatic. So we have worked really closely on transitions between activities via slant, okay, um, and tr transitions between lessons with the way that they walk through the corridors um, and waste no seconds. Shape, so the way that our students are speaking in full sentences, hands away from mouth, articulating, not mumbling, projecting their voice and making eye contact with their teachers. And persevering with routine creating, okay, because we want to make it a habit. Nudging norms, creating visible social norms and that sense of herd mentality, Peps McRae talks about, okay, in our context, we want to narrate the positive, we want to talk up the effort. And so a lot of our CPD is around reframing language, achieving that warm, strict balance between having high expectations, but um, making it sound as if everybody's doing it okay uh, building uh, belonging so similar to that but it's this idea I, I, idea of identity a sense of us um we we use sim shared language okay so at fgcs we are confident articulate speakers that's why we shape our responses 
that's an example there. And we want to boost buy-in, okay? We want to give students a sense of purpose and ownership. So we're always explaining the why behind rules, the why behind why we're back at school, etc. What's the time? Do I have time? It is 41 minutes. I'm going to zoom through this. You've got time to be in it. Keep going. You're plenty. You're good. Great. So I wanted to actually show you an example of um, something that we've started to do uh, in the last term, so the summer term, and we call them EDI boot camps. You might have noticed it in one of the items in the list earlier. And essentially what they are, are they are short, sharp, 30 minute, highly interactive um, training sessions that we have weekly or bi-weekly. I moved it to bi-weekly and I'm still tweaking it for next year. But I wanted to, uh, to do this to essentially maintain momentum behind our efforts in perfecting our practice, not with huge changes, but with um, maintaining conversations around aspects or con being conscious of behaviors and, and what to do about them. Okay, and it's nothing new. It's essentially talking about things we're already doing, but doing it better. And what I tried, to, we call them EDI boot camps, and we work in teams, and we always focus it on a phase of our lesson. So we've got about five phases. Phase two in this example is presenting new materials, chunking that material, having clarity instruction, that kind of thing. And I always link it up to a particular technique, if you like, or a strategy from Teach Like a Champion in this example, Habits of Discussion. Um, and we use Bambricks and Toyos in leverage leadership model, see it, name it, do it loosely in this, which we're going to move towards um, using in our instructional coaching program next year. And I always start off with the what and the why. OK, so what is the technique that we're looking at today? I won't read through it, but we kind of go through the what and the why here. Why it's in, what is it? Why it's important? Then we identify high frequency areas. We do that in teaching with our students. Why should we do that with ourselves? So high frequency errors that a teacher might make when they're um, trying this strategy with a class. OK, so we go through the most common errors, but also most common errors by students when you're attempting this strategy. And if we are conscious of these high frequency errors, we'll know what to do to tackle it. OK, and so we give like, you know, um, suggested scripts or what it might sound like and we look at a video example, okay? Sometimes it's from the internet, so this example is from Teach Like a Champion website. Other times it's actually examples from our staff. Um, so we look at what a good one looks like, a model example. We name the, criteria, the success criteria, what makes it so good? So we know exactly what to be looking for. And then we do it, okay? So in that session for the last 15 minutes, so the first 15 minutes was going through it, last 15 minutes, we get up, and we work in pairs and we practice it together, deliberate practice. Yes, it's a little bit of role play. I know some people kind of heave at that and you either hate it or you love it. There's no in between usually. But what it does is it makes you, it forces us to practice um, the things that we really want to embed in our teaching. Every performance profession out there has rehearsal, okay? Why in teaching do we not have rehearsal? we need to provide the space for it. And so therefore we do it in these sessions. And again, I've taken this from someone, this golden rule. I'm really sorry I can't um, credit you, but the golden rule for our staff is to stand up. You've got to get in the moment and practice it together. It's a bit of a laugh, um, but you're also practicing your, um, the way that you would deliver it before we go live in the lesson. Feedback from this has been really positive. Um, it, it's, it's fun, it's interactive, but it also allows for intellectual preparation. You know, there's centralized planning in our school as with, there is in many schools now. And um, often that might, that's a great thing, um, but often it sometimes means that teachers might not prepare for, you, you know, the planning before where we constructed our own lessons, et cetera, by ourselves. That intellectual preparation happened naturally because you're planning it yourself. That doesn't happen now if there's centralized lessons and so this allows for that intellectual preparation you're practicing when to ask that question what to do if a high frequency error happens etc and then we talk about a feedback loop so what are we going to do after our session then we don't want it to be an ongoing um, a one-off session where we have a laugh or we practice it and then we kind of go back to our old ways we want to have some kind of follow through so we say to our mentors and our mentees our line managers and the people that they're uh, supporting our teaching and learning teams and their teams that they're supporting 
go away, practice it, get someone to get, come and watch you or record yourself and share it and discuss. And so that is a loop that's over and over again. So my takeaways then, apologies if I've spoken fast, um, to sum up, conscious behaviors plus effort equals good habits. We are always talking about this. It's a really simplistic formula, um, but it captures our kind of spirit behind forming really good habits in our practice as teachers. We define our blueprint of excellence. That's our EDI framework, lesson framework and the behaviors required to execute it. Live coaching then is all about students learning and the teacher's accelerated development. One of our um, teaching and learning leads took someone with her to live coach in a lesson. And the person she took with her said to her afterwards, yeah, but you were just team teaching, that wasn't live coaching. But actually it was and what they, and that's exactly what we want, you know, from an, from an observer, from someone watching this live coaching, to them, it should look like team teaching. Um, but to our teachers, they know, oh, that was really developmental. I can see what I did um, not quite right that first time. Now I know how to do it better. We get better faster by spotting the spinach and stepping in. OK, identify your hype men to make this work. You, one person or, or the person in charge of teaching and learning or uh, the head teacher can't do that by themselves. You've got to have your cheerleaders, your early adopters, the people who will go out there and really drive that with their own team and the, and the influence that they have across your school. Support quietly and quickly, celebrate loudly and quickly. Deliberate practice then, so I talked about the EDI bootcamp, whatever that version is, as a school we're so busy as teachers, we want to be able to facilitate spaces to rehearse before we go live and that bootcamp for our school is a way to do that and, and crucially have follow through, lock in success. Do not allow CPD sessions to be one-off mandatory things that we all forget about afterwards, if you want it to be meaningful. And that is the end of my session. Thank you, Tamia. It's really, really, really great. I mean, I know for me personally, it's something I'm gonna probably have to sit and watch back through to try and digest all of those sort of nuggets of information. And I think like, you, like we spoke before we started the session, that you were kind of aware that there's loads of things sort of going through as well. So yeah. uh, you know, massive, massive thank you for condensing all of that information. And don't worry, your timing was spot on as well. So don't, don't worry about with that. Um, we've had quite a few questions come in. So I'm just gonna sort of fire through some that uh, have come in and I'll sort of gather your thoughts on that, if that's okay. Yeah. Perfect. So um, Flora Betts on Twitter, she sort of asked in terms of the culture and ethos at Forest Gate, was that something that needed improvement too before you could move forward with uh, some of the plans that you've put into place? Um, if it's specifically to do with live coaching? I think just generally in terms of enabling the schools to get better faster. So obviously the live coaching aspect of things, I think is is one area for, that I think that a couple of people have picked up on because yeah. there is that cultural change with telling someone, not that they're doing something wrong, but yeah. actually some tweaks and changes. Yeah, do, um, culture is key here. I think, you know, for the, the school context, and that's why I wanted, I felt it's important to um, go through kind of the journey the school's been on and the conditions that were already there before we could go forward with live coaching as a school. And, and um, fortunately, you know, learning walks and ongoing kind of dropping in and this open door culture was a norm by that point, by 2019. Um, that has been the norm for, for a while now. And I know that's not um, in a lot of schools, but really it's it, what I would say, and it, it's the same, you apply that with life coaching anyway, because that is difficult um, in the beginning. Um, it is having lots of ongoing training and exposure to the ideas, the, the why behind the approach of the school at every level so that people really understand the, the reasoning behind it. It's always back to the reasons behind what we're doing for the students um, and, and making sure that people really understand that vision and the big why quite regularly. Okay, perfect. I think that's, I think that's key, but I think it kind of leads into the next question or, or semi answers, I suppose, in terms of what were the initial sort of views of your staff as you changed this model of um, live coaching and so forth as to whether or not there was, so from Raf Ali sort of questioned, did teachers see it as coaching or was it um, seen as a failure if they were to be live coached or was it seen as an opportunity to grow? And 
How you yeah, that? so I mean, I don't think they saw it as a failure of their teaching because you have to remember it's it's really um, concrete, tiny aspects of practice. So the example I gave was um, move from your computer to the to the center point of your classroom. It's tiny aspects of practice that actually, when you say it to a teacher, they're like, oh yeah, actually that makes sense. You know, so it's not your 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 whole delivery of the whole lesson was awful, like you're failing the students. There's nothing like that. It's literally that those conscious behaviors that we're talking about a very specific aspect of practice and we facilitate that through picking out a technique from teach like a champion or whatever it is and it's and it's minor tweaks that is high leverage observable and actionable and bite-sized enough to and concrete enough to be practiced and achieved in a week and so it's very very achievable in that sense as well but you've got to combine that with the right culture building yeah, I think I think there's, a, there's some sort of crucial points because, like you say, it could be quite damaging if the environment isn't there to support the staff with that. Yeah. Um, got quite a few sort of questions coming in, so if do, people do have questions, feel free to post them in the chat or Q and A, and I'll pick those up for you. So, question from Donna Neely Hayes, our head teacher at Denby, um, looking at um, live coaching and how we can capture that as part of staff's ongoing CPD and growth plan. How how are you capturing that with regards to uh, Forest uh, Forest Gate? So um, one of the things that we do is in our uh, Google form, we use Google forms for our learning walks. It's, uh, I've kind of developed it over time and made it really simple now. So it's essentially it's um, what phase of the lesson it was, a wow factor, so something great that you might have seen, you write it down and the, the, the response goes straight to the email of the person that you're, you've dropped into. And um, did you live coach, yes or no? If you didn't, um, or if you did, either way, what did you life coach? So what that does, and so I might have written, no, I didn't, but if I had, I would have done this because sometimes people miss the moment and so they don't, um, but I wished I had, and this is what I would have done. And by writing it and the teacher receiving that, um, they will understand afterwards or whenever they read it, oh, this is what they were going for in case they missed it if I did do it live. And it, had I not done it live, they'd still read it and be like, oh, okay, okay that makes sense. This is what they were, uh, they were referring to in the session. And what we want to do is we want to, I, I can't remember where I read this, but stay long enough for, for you to find that highest leverage point um, that you want to give feedback on and then leave. Okay, so it's really concrete. It's really... Um, specific to a for to an aspect of the practice so you're not talking about loads of things yeah that's good, that's good. so that that sort of almost that least effort most gain yeah sort of exactly. something something like you see the example you gave just standing in front of the glass craning your neck and shouting camera yeah. transformational in, in a singular lesson yeah um so a few more questions and so in terms of the things that have had the most impact. So obviously having been at your school now from 2013 and obviously taking it through from RI through to sort of outstanding twice over now, um, what would you say were the biggest things for you, the two or three sort of biggest things that have made the most impact in the changes that you've sort of, in terms of getting better faster? So we've got very strong systems for, from kind of our, our pastoral systems all the way through our curriculum and teaching and learning systems. And they're very much interlinked. So they're not seen as discrete and separate from another. They facilitate each other and they prop each other up. And systems by themselves are nothing. Our middle leadership um, are a strong middle. So the, the quality and the expertise that we get from our middle leadership is um has been crucial in the improvement of the school. So, you know, the, the, the quality of their mentoring, the quality of their, their team training uh, and the way that they use the systems to support and intervene and um, act quickly has transformed the way that the school has improved over time. Cool, so it's, it's the sense, having solid systems, having that core body of staff. I suppose, I think you referred to your teaching and learning team as your hype people that um, get the get the sort of crowd going as well, which is a nice way to sort of view things. Yeah. Those sort of front runners of those ideas. Um, another question is in terms of how we make sure that we get better faster, but also managing pace and allowing things to embed. And uh, you know, where's your sort of view on striking that balance between making quick and timely changes, but equally yeah. allowing to embed? Yeah. So that's a really good question. I was super conscious of this because we have lots of training, right? Um, but if you notice the three priorities, they're three priorities. There's, there's not, they're quite simple and streamlined. 
they're umbrella terms, so there are lots of things feed into those. And I've not spoken about the excellent um, approach to behavior that the school has, etc. But really, they feed into a lot of our efforts as a school. Um, you know, uh, we don't want to waste any seconds in learning. That feeds into basically the way that we, our, our conscious behaviors. It all stems back to conscious behaviors that we've identified that will make us better practitioners. And so it's not really, as I mentioned, anything new each time that we're introducing as a new concept. What we're doing is we're saying, here's what we're already doing. Here's a way if you tweaked it, or here's the success criteria to do it really well. And one of the things that I've really worked on is um, using a shared language. So, and Teach Like a Champion, I know lots of schools are doing it. It provides that shared language. You're saying something really quickly. Um, and everyone understood what, it, what, what is meant by it. So that's really helped kind of reduce that cognitive load, if you like, where we're, when we're looking at something new in training, because actually they see it and they're like, well, actually it's not new. I always do this. This is how I could do it really, really well. Yeah, I, I think, I think that makes perfect sense. It's not then that shock of this change happening and so forth. It's building on the foundations that are already there and I suppose acknowledging what expertise that you've got using the tools and systems that you, you've talked about in terms of building on those. Um, question about whether or not you're going to write a book and pull these ideas together. <laughs> I don't know how to write a book. I can write a blog once in a while. Yeah. Not sure. I, th I think, I think it's, uh, it's an interesting one, I think, in the landscape of education. I think in yeah. terms of obviously moving schools forward, when you, because obviously if having been at the school for the length of time that you have, were your SLT engaged in sort of very much sharing your vision with Forest Gate going forward? Or was it something you had to work on them with for them to become advocates of, of these approaches? Um, it was the, the, um, the SLT. So one thing that's, that's really strong about the school is the, uh, the, the shared vision, but also it's not a top down thing. It's never been a top down thing. Um, and I've been very fortunate when I joined this school to have really forward thinking um, kind of outward facing SLT, um, who often ask uh, middle leaders and their teachers, what is it, what is it that we can do? Because, you know, people who are teaching every day there, our teachers are the ones who will be able to really genuinely say what we need to do to get better, because they're experiencing the daily things that we've, we've got to kind of juggle as well as be better practitioners. And so I think I've been quite happy, I've been quite lucky to work in a school where that has, it's never been really kind of top down. It's always been quite a shared and clearly communicated vision. Yeah, I think that breeds for the right environment for change as well. So, so um, with, if anyone's got any last minute questions, if you want to pop that in the chat now, um, we'll, we'll start to wrap things up. So just to kind of remind people, this session is being recorded. It will be shared on our YouTube page and posted through all of our mailing lists and so forth as well. Um, Sophie, I think you wanted to pop on very briefly. Sophie is there. There we go, Sophie. Sophie, we've got just your beard. <laughs> I, I, it was just uh, really an opportunity to say a huge thank you to Tamina. Uh, I'm sure I know I've been scribbling away, uh, making notes, and I've also ordered uh, getting uh, better, faster, the book. You've got him a few extra sales, definitely, but it's a very interesting session, and I'm sure people that tune in later on as well I know our TNL leads in our, all of our schools are really keen on uh, working with the recording of the session. So massive thank you to Mina for being so supportive of all of our work at Chilton. Thank you. There's a very uh, big thank you from Adrian, our CEO as well. No problem. I, I do hope it was useful. And I, I know I was speaking really fast because I was conscious of how much I failed my time limit last time. Um, so sorry if it was information overload, but good thing you've recorded it so you can see it afterwards now. Thank you. Thank you very much. Perfect. Brilliant. Thank you, Tamina. Thank you, everyone, for who's joining. As I say, we'll get this recording up shortly. Um, conversation can continue on Twitter as well. We'll, we'll share and post everything out through um, the Chilton Learning Trust and, and Chilton Teaching School Hub's Twitter pages as well. Perfect. Brilliant. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Tamina.